In this lecture, we'll be talking about the null space of a matrix. So last time we talked about subspaces of Rn, but given an m by n matrix A, there are actually two important subspaces that we're interested in. One of them is going to be a subspace of Rn, matching the number of columns of the matrix A, and one of them is going to be a subspace of Rm, matching the number of rows of A. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about the null space. So what is the null space of a matrix? Here's the definition. The null space of a matrix A, written null A, so that's the notation for this space, it's the set of all vectors in Rn. So again, the vectors have to have the same number of entries as the number of columns of A. And a vector gets in the null, the null space if when I multiply that matrix by that vector, I get the zero vector. So another way to think about this is to think about the corresponding linear transformation corresponding to A. So if T, which has Rn as its domain, remember the domain of our linear transformation, again, matches that number of columns. So if we have that associated linear transformation where T of X is A times X, right? So when we say linear transformation with associated matrix A, all we mean there is that T of X has formula T of X equals A times X. So all we're saying is that if a times x equals zero, we're just saying t of x equals zero. So it's just another way of saying it. And when we think about it in terms of a linear transformation, we call this the kernel of t. So kernel of t, null space of a, two different names for the same thing. Okay, so let's practice with this definition a little bit. So here's a matrix a and a vector u. Is that vector u in the null space of a? Well, that's actually a pretty easy question to answer because all we have to do is we have to check whether a times u equals zero. If the answer to that question is yes, then yes, the vector is in the null space. If a times u turns out to not be the zero vector, then that vector is not in the null space. So that's all we have to do. So what's a times u? So it's this matrix, one, negative three, negative two, negative five, nine, one, multiplied by the vector five, three, negative two. I'm gonna use the row column method so if I multiply here, one times five, plus negative three times three, plus negative two times negative two, and then in the second entry, the second row of my matrix A times the entries of the vector U, negative five times five, plus nine times three, plus one times negative two. And if I work all that out, I do in fact get zero, zero. Notice by the way, that U is in R3, but A times U is the zero vector in R2, right? Because my matrix isn't square, the domain of that linear transformation is R3, the codomain is R2, right? So it's okay if the zero vector that you get has a different number of entries than the vector that you multiplied by, that depends on the shape of the matrix. All right, here's a similar question. Here's a matrix A. We wanna know for what values of H is this vector u, which has entries negative four and this mysterious variable h, for what values of h is that vector u in the null space of a? But again, all we have to do is to check when that vector a times u is actually in uh, equal to the zero vector. So let's multiply. Negative three, six, one, negative two, negative two, four, multiplied by negative four H. When we work all that out, as expected, we get a result that has H's in it. In this case, we get 12 plus six H. We get negative four minus two H and then eight plus four H. Now for this to equal the zero vector, all three of those entries will have to equal zero at the same time, simultaneously for the same value of H. So we have three equations 12 plus 6h equals 0, negative 4 minus 2h equals 0, 8 plus 4h equals 0. And these equations better have the exact same solution. Otherwise, the answer to our question would be that there are no values of h to make this work. But as it turns out, when I solve each of these equations, I get h equals negative 2. So negative 2 is the only value of h that makes this work. So h equals negative 2, that's my solution. Again, if those three equations had come up with different solutions, then there would not have been one single value of h that would make this problem work out. Okay, so here's an important theorem. So we call this the null space, and we talked about subspaces in the previous lecture. So this is how this ties together. In fact, any matrix A 
the null space of that matrix is the subspace of Rn. So if you remember what we talked about in the previous lecture, we've got three things to prove. We've got to prove that the zero vector is in the null space. We've got to prove that if you have two vectors in the null space, then the sum of those vectors is in the null space. And we have to prove that if you have a vector in the null space and any scalar, then that scalar times the vector is in the null space. So first of all, to show that the null space contains the zero vector, remember to, to figure out whether or not a vector is in the null space, all we have to do is multiply the matrix by that vector and see whether or not we get zero. But in this case, we're multiplying the matrix A by the zero vector, and it doesn't matter what the matrix is, we're always gonna get the zero vector when we do that. And so that means that the zero vector, which is right here, that zero vector is in the null space. All right, a little bit more work here to prove that if two vectors are in the null space, then the sum of those vectors is in the null space. Remember how we started these kinds of problems in the previous lecture. We start out by saying, all right, you've got your set that you think might be a subspace. Let's pick two arbitrary elements out of that set. Let U and V be in the null space. So what do we know about U and V? We know they're in the null space, which means that A times the first vector is the zero vector. A times the second vector is the zero vector. So that's the definition, right? So when I say by definition here, that's by the definition of the words null space. That's what a null space is. Okay, so why is A times U plus V in the null space? Or why is A times U plus V equal to zero vector? So this is to check whether U plus V, that vector there, is in the null space of A. And the way we check to see if a vector is in the null space is we multiply our matrix by that vector and see whether or not we get zero. And using our algebraic rules, we do in fact get zero. That's what we wanted. And so U plus V is in the null space. Similarly, we check that if U is in the null space and C is any scalar, then C times U is in the null space, very similar way, right? So we say, let U be in the null space of A. And what does that mean? That means A times U is zero. So again, this is to check whether C U is in the null space. And the way that we check whether something's in the null space is we multiply the matrix by that vector and see whether or not we get zero. Again, using our algebraic rules, we do get zero, that's a check. And so we get what we want. So we've proved all three pieces of this theorem, proving that the null space is in fact a space, right? So not just a null set of vectors, but an actual space. So one of the problems with understanding the null space is that the definition of the null space of A is what we sometimes call an implicit definition. It gives us a condition that has to be checked for us to know whether or not a vector is in that null space. So if I hand you a vector and say, here's a vector I found on the floor, is this vector in the null space? You can check that. But if I said, hey, can you give me a vector in this null space? It's hard to know how you would do that, right? There's no obvious way to just sort of generate an element of the null space just from this definition. So to practice that, here's another example. So here we have a matrix A, and instead of me giving you a vector and asking you, is this vector in this null space, I'm asking you to find a spanning set for null space of A. So I'm not even just asking you for one vector that's in the null space of A. I'm asking you for a set of vectors whose span is the null space of A. So that's actually a big lift. That's a lot of, of what I'm asking you to do. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we're gonna go back to the definition. What is the null space of A? It's vectors that have this property that A times X equals zero. But we know how to solve that kind of equation. We set up our augmented matrix and row reduce it. So I've done that hard work for you. So here's our row reduced matrix. And so what does the solution to this equation look like? Well, our first row represents the equation X1 equals two X2 plus X4 minus three X5. There's no column in the second, there's no pivot in the second column, so x2 is free. x3 is going to equal negative 2x4 plus 2x5. There's no pivot in the fourth or fifth column, so x4 and x5 are also free. So that's my general solution, but I'm going to write this in parametric form, and I'll show you that on the next slide. So here's my parametric form of my solution. And because we had three free variables, I get three vectors that sort of generate, in this case, span the solution that we're looking for. So these three vectors here, this vector, this vector, and this vector, those vectors are the spanning set that we're looking for. So the span of those three vectors is the null space of A, because any vector that is a linear combination of those three vectors is in the span, because we, this is the solution to AX equals zero. And 
any solution to AX equals zero has this form. So that's exactly what we're looking for. So let's practice one more time. So similar kind of question, a little bit more simple of a matrix. So here's my matrix B. I want to find a spanning set for the null space of B. All right, so I've got to solve B x equals the zero vector. So I'm going to set up my augmented matrix, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 4, negative 2, 0, 0, 1, 0. Add my extra column of zeros on the end. And then I'm going to row reduce. Only one step needed here. And there is our result of row reducing. So you can use technology for that, or you can just row reduce it by hand. There's only one, uh, actually two steps. We've got to do a scale and a replace. Okay, so what does my solution look like? Okay, so the first row represents the equation x1 equals negative 2x4. The second, uh, there's no column, there's no pivot in column two, so x2 is free. The second row represents x3 equals one half x4, and then of course x4 is free. Okay, but the parametric solution would be that the vector x, which is equal to x1, x2, x3, x4, well, x1 we know is negative 2 x4. x2 is free, so we just write x2 equals x2. x3 is 1 half x4, and x4 is free, so we just write x4 equals x4. And if I split these into two separate vectors, what I get is x2 multiplied by the vector 0, 1, 0, 0, and x4 multiplied by the vector negative 2, 0, 1 half, 1. So these two vectors, this vector and this vector, this is a spanning set for the null space of A. And again, what does that mean? That means that every vector in the null space is a linear combination of those two vectors, and every linear combination of those two vectors is an element of the null space. So when we talk about finding a spanning set for the null space of A, what did we do? We solved the matrix equation AX equals zero, and wrote our solution in parametric form. And we have one vector in our spanning set for each free variable in that equation. But remember the linearly independent columns theorem. What we know from that theorem is that if we have a pivot in every column, then that means that we have only the solution x equals zero. And that would mean that the null space of A is just the zero vector. And of course, if the null space of A is only the zero vector, that means we would have to have a pivot in every column. So that if and only if goes in both directions. So we can apply a lot of the knowledge that we learned earlier in this course to this new situation that we've been studying. So in the next lecture, we're gonna be talking about the other associated space to a matrix called the column space. See you then.